Good evening. I think we're we're going live. We'll see if this works. We're going to try to live stream this. So I'm going to try to use this microphone. Is this like too much or is it no? It's all right. Okay. Good. <clears throat> all right. Um, we are we are here. I'm here. Okay. <laughs> huh. Um, well, good evening. Uh, we are live streaming to uh, Facebook right now as well because in part I, I know some folks couldn't make it and um, we have the capacity and I thought we'll give it a try. So hopefully if you're watching this at home, you're able to uh, hear us and see us and see the screen in a decent way. So, um, oh, Josh is giving me the heads up. Good. All right. So. Good evening and, and welcome to the first of our midweek Lenten programs. This has become a, a really treasured tradition at Calvary and I'm so glad that we can do it every year. I'm um, very grateful for Bob and Terry in the back, so thank you. <laughs> um, <clears throat> we had some wonderful soups tonight. Thank you to all the soup makers and bread makers or buyers and biscuit makers and dessert makers and, and everything. Um, we're, we're very fortunate to be well fed in all of this. Um, so the theme for this midweek Lenten program is pilgrimage. And um, I kind of thought about this theme in different ways. And maybe it was what we're going to talk about tonight with our racial justice pilgrimage that I was part of that kind of led me to think about pilgrimages in general. But it also seems like such an appropriate topic for um, the midweek, for the Lenten season, um, a season where we're asked to return our hearts and our whole selves to God and kind of take an intentional journey um, into sometimes literal or figurative wilderness and um, find a way to take what has been clinging to us or um, serving as an idol or distraction push that away from us so that we can recenter ourselves on hearing God's voice, on, on finding out where we can find our inner peace and our outer peace. And I think all of those are part of pilgrimages. And um, the photo that we have here on the screen is a, a picture of the Camino um, de Santiago. And that is one of the more famous pilgrimages of uh, folks walking from France, somewhere in France. Lords, okay. I was looking at. Um, okay, and then going to Santiago, um, Spain. I don't know much more else about it. Sorry, I should. <laughs> but it is. Um, and if you remember Andrew Craver, who was a student pastor here many years, well, about six years ago, um, he did the the Camino. I know as a pilgrimage, and it was really a meaningful experience. So. Pilgrimages can be those figurative, those literal ones. Um, <clears throat> and in two weeks, we will be um, taking part in a labyrinth walking. Uh, so that's a little bit more on, on walking and the pilgrimage. Or they can also be uh, pilgrimages of the spirit. And they could also be kind of what I experienced. And tonight, we'll, we'll talk about the racial justice pilgrimage, which was a literal pilgrimage, but also a pilgrimage of, of an intentional act of trying to return ourselves to God and to find ways that we can um, take part in some truth telling and um, creating space to, to imagine a new, more just future. So, um, so we'll get into that. So let's uh, begin with this brief worship experience and um, let us pray together. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you and also with you. We gather as pilgrims on a journey. We are kindred on the road. We gather to help each other find the harmony that Christ invites us to find. For the hope we carry, we lift our voices to the God of justice, peace, and love. So let's pray this prayer together. Let's just pause for a moment um, as we take part in these pilgrimages to just maybe set an intention or find a way that you want to center yourself tonight. And again, as we're in the midst of Lent already, but on this 40-day journey of uh, maybe where you feel like you want to enter into this pilgrimage. So for a moment, let's just uh, pause for silence. Join together in prayer. 
Teach us, O oh Lord, not to hold on to life too tightly, but lightly, gently, and gracefully. Teach us that significance and meaning in life comes from conversations we share along the journey with fellow travelers. Teach us to walk as pilgrims, traveling by faith, being open to surprise, receiving the gifts that you and others seek to offer us along the way. Amen. So, so Blair and I, Pastor Blair and I, were going to be part of, we're, we were going to be tag teaming on this, um, this first Lenten program, um, but as you know, she's traveling and um, up with Warren's family, um, and so I'm here as soloing, uh, but we were both part of this racial justice pilgrimage. Um, is this a good spot for me to, you can all see, right? I'm not in front of the screen. Okay. Okay. If you, okay. Can you see, or do you need me to go somewhere? Okay. <laughs> dance. <laughs> um, I feel like this is just a big, yeah, I feel like I'm about to kind of singing. Okay, so anyway, so we were part of this racial justice pilgrimage um, this September, and um, pictured here is actually something we'll talk about at the end of the presentation, one of the sites that we saw, um, the lynching memorial, uh, that is in all, this is all part of Montgomery, Alabama. So we traveled to Montgomery, Alabama from September 13th through the 16th. Um, there was a huge collection of Northern Province clergy. Um, it was not a mandatory event as it was going to be three years ago uh, because of COVID and, and folks having difficulty with that. But I would say at least 90% of all clergy did attend, which was really great because it was a voluntary um, exercise. So um, I just love this definition kind of for maybe what we were trying to do. It's actually the definition of a uh, racial justice center that was helping to lead the training, but to be a brave space where truth telling is possible. Um, so um, Sophie thought that we needed more color in this presentation, so I apologize if you can't see it, but it's, <laughs> it was too white. I, so the, the questions are, how did this all come about? And I promise I'll be, try to be brief on, on this, but um, so we've had lots of past synod gatherings. So synods are, you know, our every four year gatherings of all of the churches in the Northern province. We've had many, many gatherings where we've made statements um, that are, are anti-racism statements, uh, statements of racial justice um, and uh, opposing discrimination. We also have foundational documents. We have our Ground of Unity and our Moravian Covenant for Christian Living. Um, and really, I think the Unity Board statement is what um, surmised the past statements on anti-racism in the very core of the Moravian understanding of humanity, the God-given equality of all people is fundamental. Um, so all of our foundational documents have, have spoken in the past several years, or many years, um, but it wasn't until 2018 that the Northern Province Synod um, had a resolution, and it was a many-part resolution, um, which if you're interested, I can point it out to you. But one of the resolutions, um, as again, we're discussing um, how there is still racism in our country, um, there, the need for education, the need for, like I said before, to be a truth-telling uh, place and to learn our history and to learn um, where we are today and the ramifications of history upon uh, today. Um, the Northern Province called upon uh, the PEC, our, our conference, to require all of the pastors to receive anti-racism training, and um, that took the form of um, putting together a racial justice task force to um, create this pilgrimage. Um, so, the agenda of the pilgrimage was an invitation to explore race through the lens of faith and justice, and like the Synod Resolution said, it really was to um, have all clergy participate in anti-racism training, um, which was done, and we'll get into this in a bit, by a, a woman named um, Dr. Catherine Meeks. Um, 
but it was also to do the physical work of pilgrimage and to travel to some important sites where um, things happened in our country's history, uh, things that would orient us in the civil rights movement, but also look at um, where race and faith and justice was from the very beginnings of bringing enslaved people to America to um, then the rest, um, Reconstruction era and lynchings and so forth. So um, Montgomery seemed like the spot that would allow us to accomplish a lot of that. So uh, that's why we picked Montgomery. It very easily could have done Atlanta, Georgia as well, or some of the other sites. But Montgomery has all of these items, all these places that we were able to visit within a short time period. So we will talk about all of these in a second. Um, so when we were invited to this pilgrimage, these were the words that were used. Um, the Reverend Dr. Betsy Miller, who is our provincial uh, president, she actually was worshiping with us a few weeks ago as well. Um, she said, we're invited to weep, to rest, and to lament. Um, and I would add to learn and create that safe space uh, for truth telling. Um, so it was really interesting as we began, and just a moment actually, this is the woman that I'm gonna be talking about, uh, Dr. Catherine Meeks. But as we began, she um, introduced us to why this is so important to call it a pilgrimage. And I thought, again, for this entire series, it kind of framed it for me. So a pilgrimage, a pilgrim helps you carry your burdens. So you're doing it together as community. You are usually, you're never, you're not often on a pilgrimage alone. Um, a pilgrimage can help you carry the cross, she said. Um, some other things that Catherine Meeks was telling us was that, you know, when we talk about racial justice, to say racial reconciliation, there's an interesting way to think about that, and it does imply that there was a relationship. And she kind of challenged us to ask if maybe we need to look at racial justice in a new way by learning the history rather than telling ourselves there was a relationship between um, African Americans and whites that were splintered to kind of look at what the history has shown and um, understand that history so we're not reconciling, we're learning our history and moving forward and caring for each other. Um, we'll kind of talk about that a little bit more. Um, but anyway, so we started our pilgrimage um, in the hotel at, in Montgomery with um, the Reverend Dr. Frank Crouch. And um, Frank was the former dean of the Moravian Seminary. And he has been working since he retired um, on probably what will be a book, I would imagine, but it's some articles around um, the Moravians and slavery and um, kind of re, re understanding and um, rediscovering some history or telling some history that hasn't been told before. Um, so we, I think, especially if, if I think about when I grew up and if you would have asked me, 10 years ago, 20 years ago, did the Northern Province own slaves? Um, I don't know, if I asked you that today, oh, without seeing this, <laughs> sorry. Um, would you, what would you say? That did the, the Northern Moravians own slaves? I mean, now you're, yes, I mean, you, you might have known that, and now, um, I think, in all honesty, 10 years ago, I would have said no, or you know, maybe there was a slave that was here, but it was probably because, no offense, the Southern Moravians had slaves, and you know, this, the South did that, and um, they brought a slave up for it, but we, um, or there would have been maybe in my mind a sense of, well, but, but we believed in equality, and so we treated slaved, enslaved, not enslaved people all the same. There was education, there was health care, there was housing. Um, it would all be, you know, the famous God's Acre, everybody be buried together. Um, so it's okay, you know, not, not that I'd say it's okay, but it's, no, you know. Um, 
I think what he's understanding and, and recovering is um, the fact that Moravians from their very beginnings, um, and we, you might know the stories about going over to the Caribbean islands, um, wanting to spread the gospel to the enslaved uh, folks that were there, um, something that was not being done by any other Protestants at that time, which is notable, uh, but not protesting the in institution of slavery itself. So um, Moravians were coming still with a very notion of this white supremacy and, and hierarchy in race. Um, and so coming into that space, not to disrupt the institution of slavery, but to say, which is still something, but to say these are humans that do deserve and uh, should be hearing the gospel of Jesus. So um, Moravians did not try to tear down that hierarchy or the white supremacy or the un understanding that God was ordaining slavery um, and that there was a, some readings from, from Pauline text, of, Paul's text of, of understanding that order. Um, so they were very much in line with that belief. And um, that's not unusual for that day at all, but um, in my mind, you know, there's a rosy picture of Moravians and historic Moravians of saying, no, no, that wasn't us. And I think um, it wasn't until hearing Frank talk about this about 10 years ago that I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> so here we are. So we learned um, a lot from Frank for, for a good number of hours. Um, and I just found this quote, which I kind of thought was um, a way to summarize it, that you know, the same year Bethlehem was, was um, well, 1742, when Moravian College was founded, there were enslaved individuals from St. Thomas um, purchased and brought up to Bethlehem. And so Bethlehem was built with the help of those enslaved peoples, um, which were, again, kept in Bethlehem. And while treated in a better way than some enslaved people, uh, still did not have the freedom um, to to be um, doing as they choose. So um, there was a lot more to that lecture and I'm really hoping Frank at some point will put it all together and um, either we'll have a presentation of some form. So um, there were two things I wrote down. We, we were given a little travel journal um, and there were two quotes that I wrote down in this way. One, um, I think they both kind of reflect each other. One from Deuteronomy and I believe Frank was using this as his central message. Only be careful and watch yourselves closely so that you do not forget the things your eyes have seen. So again, he was telling us, let's not forget what we've learned. Um, and I saw this somewhere written, I think on a statue in Montgomery, um, what Dr. King wrote, the end we seek is a society that can live with its conscience. And I just thought both of those seemed like they fit in together. Okay, so, um, so after Frank's presentation, we had a good day of uh, being with Dr. Catherine Meeks. And I have some material from her center um, for racial justice that she operates in Atlanta. She is an Episcopalian, so she's been doing this work with Episcopalians, so it's kind of cool to have her. This is a picture of her being thanked and given the complimentary Moravian star, which we have to <laughs> give to everybody that's <laughs> gives a. Um, so what did, um, a little bit of what Catherine Meeks talked about, um, and there's a great, if you ever have a chance and you want to go further, there's a great documentary series. It's a three-part series on PBS, which I think is still free somehow, but uh, called Race, the Power of Illusion. And it's actually a great way to think about race because is, is race an actual thing? Do we actually have different races of people? Um, that's kind of an interesting, um, it's, it was a construct, um, and clearly a, a construct of slavery, of, of American slavery, um, 
was based on, on racial skin color. If we go back to biblical slavery, there was not, or Roman slavery, there was not the slavery based on the color of your skin. Um, we can say race is an illusion, but at the same time, it's not an illusion because we know what historical precedent, you know, what has come out of um, classifying people. So, you know, there's lots of, um, if you ever read and, get, and watch these series, you'll hear all about the, you know, classifications of what made a person black versus white and, you know, how much seven-eighths or, you know, nine-twelfths or whatever you had to do. Um, but yet it, it's not an illusion, it's still not an illusion today. Um, so she talked a lot about that and also, um, you know, what, what we, where we've been again with um, slavery being introduced as a race-based system and that being built on the myth of white supremacy. And, um, but what Catherine Meeks was really about, and I, was really appreciative of this because it's one of my favorite theologians, uh, is a guy named Howard Thurman. And Howard Thurman was kind of the, you could think of him as the mentor to Dr. King, to Dr. Martin Luther King. So he's sort of Dr. Martin Luther King's pastor. He was really what you could call a, like a, a mystic, uh, but kind of a earthly mystic. So he, he really participated in the sort of pre-civil rights movement. And the rumor is, is that Dr. King always carried this book around with him in his briefcase um, because it was sort of his go-to, uh, but Jesus and the Disinherited. And so Catherine Meek spent a lot of time educating us about the works of Thurman. Um, and in particular, because Howard Thurman is, was really interested not in only the justice work on the outside, but in believing that we need, what happened? I just did too many things, okay. Stay. He believed that you needed to do the inner work to do the outer work, or we needed to kind of make sure we were not only so involved in justice work and in civil rights changes, and if you think about all the things that were being done in the 60s and the 50s with uh, desegregation and very important legal battles and things like that, but he was very much concerned that we would be changing the spirit of ourselves and, and doing the inner work. And um, I think Catherine Meeks really was in that camp of following Thurman in saying, um, to, to white and black people, but to say that we need to do, you know, we need to look at who we are. And one of the questions she said, you know, has racism wounded us? Um, and what has it prevented us from, how has it prevented us from being fully human? Um, and um, I don't know if anybody has, I mean, I can, I feel like I keep talking because I want to get through this and not <laughs> talking fast. But, um, you know, has racism wounded us, wounded you? Can you think of anything? We didn't really directly talk about critical race theory. I mean, I'd say um, the understanding of doing truth telling, of learning history. Um, I think that word is really unfortunate because it's become so loaded, but I think uh, what we were doing was what any, anybody should do of any, you know, in any school or any really, any adult should do uh, is just learn our history. And so that's really what we were, you know, we were doing. It wasn't, um, it was just, you know, it was history being taught. So I don't, 
We didn't talk about that issue directly, but. Um, I, yeah, right, right, and yeah, yeah. Uh, if you, I mean, it's kind of a personal question to think about, but. Um. Mm -hmm. Right, you're kind of talking about how you know racism excludes it, someone, but it, it it impacts us as well. Like if it's not if, if you know us as in white people, um, we think it's impacting, you know. But what have we lost out of not being able to um, have a relationship, have um, an experience with some a different culture, uh, have you know, and so or have kind of separate living situations and you know I think that's certainly in many of our cities and townships we see clear distinctions between um, race and, and, and things it's still today I mean it lingers today sorry and Melissa that 
Now, I can't remember where I heard that. That might also be in the race power of illusion, but yeah, that was mentioned. But I'm really glad you brought up the book. Um, I think that might be, there was a book of like suggested readings and um, that might be part of that. I've never read it, but I've heard of it. And yeah, it's, it's. Um, <clears throat> Oh. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Huh. Okay. So this is called cast. been a big mm. okay yeah wow yeah so thank you well the reading list and yeah but that's good to Sam Okay, well, well, this just gives you a taste of what, so we were kind of talking about that inner work, which I thought was interesting, because a lot of this might be just, you're tempted to just kind of launch yourself out into the Montgomery, you know, all the civil rights memorials and everything, and just do the learning, and let's do the justice work, and let's, you know, change what's the iniquity, I mean, and certainly talk about structural racism and anything, but also talk about the inner work and what needs to be looked at, so. So again, back to Thurman, um, we talked a lot about, about him, and this is his central thesis of his book, is what does the Church of Jesus Christ say to those who live with their backs against the wall? Um, so really, we talked about religion, the fact that, you know, what do we have to say about people who are facing um, discrimination, racism, or put in any other, you know, um, affordable housing, poverty, or anything? Um, what do we have to say as a church to that? Um, okay, this is proof that I went on the trip. Um, <laughs> so there I am. All uh, right. So we went to four different um, memorial sites or different museums. Um, and I'll just briefly talk about them. And um, the first was uh, the Rosa Parks Center. And um, so Rosa Parks in December, on December 1st, 1955, um, a lot of times people say on December 1st, 1955, she was just tired and she didn't want to get up. She was on the bus on her way home after a long day. Um, in those days, of course, buses in the South were segregated. You'd be sitting in the back. You were allowed to sit in the, a little bit towards the front if you were, if there were no white people, but there were, it was now crowded. Um, she was asked to move back and she refused. Um, that's the, story of Rosa Parks that we often tell, what the history of, and if you went to see David Lamont last year with Alyssa did, she talk, he talks a lot about this and, and 
great speaker, but um, that it didn't start on December 1st. She was part of an organizing movement. It talks about, you know, how important it is when you go to those like boring committee meetings, like church committee meetings, um, <laughs> which are never boring, except for trustees meetings, which are never boring. And, but, <laughs> but that planning meetings are actually how the civil rights movement started. So she was part of a, a movement, um, I think it was the NAACP, a lot of things going on beforehand, a lot of meetings, a lot of planning, and all of that was in place so that after she refused to get up, that night um, students were gathered and others, helpers were gathered to mimeograph, because there were no copiers, right? Um, flyers, like thousands of flyers, so that the bus boycott could start the next day. So they had this huge army of people. So then the bus boycott had started from December 5th through December 20th next year. Um, boycotted, changed the laws um, of desegregating the buses. Okay, so that was fun. And then the most of the day we spent at the Legacy Museum. Um, does anybody hear of Brian Stevenson? Um, yeah. So Just Mercy he wrote. Just, he wrote the book Just Mercy, which has also been made into a movie. I think it's on Netflix. So um, I think. Uh, he is a lawyer and he set up um, the, uh, I always forget the name, Equal something organization um, in Montgomery, supporting people who had been falsely accused and, um, and on mostly on death row uh, inmates. So he uh, has been part of this movement to try to exonerate um, uh, people who have been falsely accused for many years. And um, he's been just huge in, in many other uh, ways of fighting and, and trying to create movements around anti-racism. So this is his initiative called the Legacy Museum. Um, and it, I mean, not that you go to Montgomery every day probably, but it's really worth a trip to Montgomery. It's, I can equate it to like the Holocaust Museum in DC, in Washington, um, in terms of its like interactiveness and um, immersing you. Uh, I don't think we were allowed to take pictures, but um, yeah, I wanted to start here. This is actually at the lynching memorial, which was outside, which is also part of what Brian Stevenson did. But it kind of shows you what we saw inside. Statues of, of people uh, being taken from Africa and, uh, and being sold into slavery, uh, or perhaps being on, on a, sl a selling block in America. Um, but that is how the museum starts um, with the middle, what we call the middle passage of the passage from being uh, captured or sold in Africa and purchased and uh, shipped to either America or as you might know, there's many, many, many more slaves were shipped to um, the Caribbean or Brazil or South America. So we're, um, but the museum really covers the whole legacy of, of racism and the, what you might say is the, the black, one of the black experiences in America from the Middle Passage, slavery, um, freedom, uh, but the Jim Crow laws, um, so the, the, you know, the segregation laws um, amidst Jim Crow and before Jim Crow the history of lynchings in America, and then spent some time talking about present day like inequalities, what we talked about, um, mass incarceration and so forth. It was so big that we were sort of like pushed through it. So I feel like it would be good to go back. But, um, but talking about religion, I wrote down this quote that had, was from um, the governor of Mississippi. As a Christian nation, the duty of the South is to keep them, meaning enslaved people, in the present position at any cost. So that was um, in 1857. So I had a lot more things written down, but we also looked at the post-Civil War history. Um, so 
after the Civil War, there was a time period of reconstruction and um, how there was some measures being done to try to uh, include African Americans in life and some were getting elected offices and doing some good things and getting, getting some, some land and so forth. The reaction to Reconstruction then being Jim Crow laws and um, again now a, a segregation that was really becoming more and more uh, strict. I just wrote down, I, again, I wrote down random things, but I just found this interesting. The KKK was founded, I learned, on Christmas Eve, um, and that was right after the Civil War. And then this thing, that in 1898, 73% of Alabama state revenue is from convict leasing. So a huge, huge thing of, of um, again, picking up people on kind of petty crimes or loitering or other things and then making money off of, that's one form of slavery that's never been outlawed is, is within the prison system. So making money off of leasing them. So again, the modern day effects, um, you probably know about mass incarceration and um, the unequal treatment of, of different drug crimes. Um, so crack, when you're arrested for selling crack, you're much higher prison sentence than cocaine, so often targeting more black people than white people. Um, the system of, of what black kids often face, um, this national rate of being expelled or suspended three times more likely. Um, it was a, it was a lot. I'm gonna just pause, do you have any questions? Sorry. So um, the other part of our day was going to the lynching museum, uh, the lynching memorial. And this was again part of this legacy museum, but was a way to try to document and memorialize um, the history of lynchings, which is probably, again, one of the, the painful parts of our history that we often don't know about or, or tell as much. Um, each of those items up there looks like this up close, and it is of a county in the United States, um, and then it is of the names that they know of the people who have been lynched um, in that area. And um, I should have written down the numbers, but um, I think they think they only know about maybe half or less than that of people who, who have been. So it was interesting that in this little book that we're using a little bit for some reflections, Are We There Yet? Pilgrimage in the Season of Lent, one of the contributors is actually Catherine Meeks who talked to us. And she wrote a little bit about lynchings and I just thought I would share it because it seemed to be um, <clears throat> kind of a reflection on what this is all about. Well, she's, she writes first um, about, you know, what, who was lit, who, who was lit, why were they lynched? Um, you know, the, while the lynch person on a rare occasion had committed a crime, people were lynched for standing up for the rights of others, for being in the wrong place, or simply for being black. Um, she continues about pilgrimages to historical lynching sites in memory of the many victims are needed. Um, talks about modern day pilgrims who are attempting to dismantle oppression in sustainable ways must pay attention to this cloud of witnesses. And this again is one of the ways to remember. Um, but then, okay. this is where I wanted to see. Um, so while the lynching pilgrimages that I have organized help us to remember this terrible and tragic history, these pilgrimages also call us to move into new frontiers, both individually and collectively. Frontiers are those borderlands between places, understandings, and hearts and minds. Um, so pilgrims, she writes, have to stay alert to apathy and inertia. It's too easy to stay comfortable emotionally, physically, spiritually, in privileged places. 
The mere act of showing up for this pilgrimage can be an opportunity to break open these places. The breaking open and the brokenness makes it possible for new frontiers to be imagined and embraced. So, again, I get the sense, <clears throat> and she focuses a lot of her week that she's writing on uh, the physical act of, of doing these pilgrimages. Um, so finally, the last site that we went to was the Dexter Avenue um, Baptist Church. And this is um, really close to the state capitol building in Montgomery, it's the state capitol in Montgomery. Um, Dexter Avenue, most, it's still in existence, it's still a church, but it's uh, most famously known as the place that Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. served as pastor and where um, he was called out in a meeting after the Montgomery bus boycott to lead the bus boycott. So to organize, well, he organized it here, but he was also called in as the leader. Um, it's actually interesting because he was very young and very new to town. So watch out if you're new to town, what you might be called out to, <laughs> to do. Uh, <laughs> they were like, you're new, let's uh. <laughs> So this is the outside of the church. Um, it's just really, we had a tour guide um, there that let us in. And I think the most interesting thing that she said, I mean, it was, it was a lot about the, the church and where they're at, but you know, the civil rights movement started in a church. So it, it started talking about religion again, but um, it, which is a little different in terms of some movements today that aren't maybe as grounded in the church, but this, the civil rights movement was very much while having different wings was very much centered in the church and obviously King's philosophies of nonviolence and what he learned from Gandhi and from, from others, but was very much centered in religious thought. So this is the inside of Dexter Avenue with all of us. I'm in the front, so you can't see me. I was trying to figure out where I was. Okay, and that's, that's the end. Um, so, I kind of put this all together, hoping it made sense. And maybe if Blair was here, she'd add something else. So I apologize. Um, and trying to talk about kind of how we, what we experienced in that pilgrimage, but also how it, it was not only about the physical act of journeying or learning our history, um, but it was also about the inner work, which is ongoing. Um, so I think all of that is part of our of pilgrimage. Um, the other part of this, which the Synod Resolution got at, is what we're doing right now, um, is that we're, we are to, we are called, we pastors, we're called to take this back to our congregations and share it and, you know, find ways, um, not constructed ways that seem inauthentic, but find ways that we can do a better job at um, anti-racism work and working with beyond our, our own folks. Um, and honestly, this happened and then the fall happened and Advent started and it was like, when am I gonna do this? And I really wanna share this. <laughs> and would anybody show up if I just said, come to church on a random night? So that's why I thought, well, Lent is a good time to, to do this. So, um, so okay, um, stop for questions. We did. We had small group conversations. Um, in fact, we, we formed like a little cohort, a group um, that would kind of break occasionally. And then um, we have had two Zoom meetings since this where we talk about like, well, how could we make this, how can we bring this back to our churches? Um, there was actually an Advent series um, that was done with Catherine Meeks, but it got planned. <laughs> we had Josh doing an Advent series and it was kind of, uh, it was after the fact. So. Um, things like that, of like, how do we take this? Like, I was suggesting to have Frank Crouch share his presentation somehow to other people. It's so fascinating, and it, he, I didn't even talk about, like, what he talks about with some um, pastors in New York City who are Moravian who led the anti-lynching campaign. So there were actually, like, Moravians out in front in the 1900s leading some really cool stuff. But um, we talk about, like, well, what else can we do 
you know, now. Um, yeah, thanks. Yes. Oh my gosh, wow. So. Oh. <laughs> oh. Huh. Wow. Jeez. Okay. Interesting, yeah, cycle of kids. Huh. Wow. Any other questions or um, ideas of, you know, what you would like to, if there's anything. Actually, glad I was going to say that in the beginning. I'm glad you say kind of, you know, there's differences in I, uh, in the very beginning, and I was glad they did this. They said this is going to be about anti-racism training uh, for uh, talking about the black experience in America. It's not going to be. It's not that we're diminishing the Latino experience in America or the LGBT experience. You know, the, there's so many areas of oppression in that are out there that we should address, but like, we're not gonna try to handle them all. So don't get upset when you're not, we're not talking about, you know, like, like um, immigrants, immigration or um, like farm workers rights or something like, that's also important, but this is gonna be about the black experience. So that was kind of nice to like set that stage and um, because sometimes we try to do it all or we're like feel guilty that we're not dealing with every single wrong thing and, and I was glad that they, they like acknowledged that. Um, so, yeah. Well, yeah, that's a tough one. <laughs> yeah. And I, you know, to Sam's point about like critical race theory and, and the things, I mean, I think, you know, Again, what we were doing was just learning history. Um, it wasn't, there wasn't some grand agenda of some, I mean, it, it was about learning what happened and I think, and not trying to make us feel guilty, but just creating a, a brave space to realize where we've been and realize where we wanna go. And you know, that we're further than, I mean, I think we all need to look at the fact that lynching, we, we were not, constructing those memorials, you know, maybe we could argue with that, but they're not, there's not the huge numbers of people that are, are being, you know, we've moved as America. And that's good. And we can't just say, oh, it's just, but at the same time, not to say we're, we're there yet. And, you know, that, that's like anything. We're not, um, so... Mm-hmm.
be something with CACLV with um, their um, color color all color boundaries or something. There's a yeah, there is a program. I think it's it's like coloring beyond the boundaries or color outside the line, something like that. Yeah, there's. Um, All right, well, I agree, but you know, we probably won't, yeah, yes, yes. <laughs> And if anybody's interested, that's a class that Episcopalian friends did, yeah. And um, in fact, I was thinking when Jeff talked about, uh, there's an article about like why the Irish didn't become black, or something about Irish and black, like the, why the Irish became white, because they didn't want to be black. Like they were, they wanted to designate themselves as, yeah, so they like molded from being understood as Irish to just wanting to be white. And there's a really good, I remember that from, I was thinking about that when you were. Anyway, yeah, there's a lot of good resources out there. Um, that was great. And it was nice because it was. I think it's selective as we go to the people who already have a teaching that something's wrong somewhere. Yeah. Yeah. Right. But yeah, so how about if, um, if anybody else has any questions or one in chat, I'll be here. There's, um, there's some suggested reading and other memorabilia from the trip, so if you wanna peruse, you're welcome to. But we'll end and then if anybody's really tired, they can go home. <laughs> okay, <laughs> we're cold. I think, I feel like our heat is not working fully in this. Sorry, Dave. <laughs> yeah, I know, sorry. Just, um, well, we had a lot of great, the other thing we did besides small groups, we had a lot of great worship. We um, obviously had a ton of pastors, so there was no shortage of people to lead stuff. Um, we also celebrated our kind of clergy renewal time at this covenant, uh, covenant of, what's it called, cup of covenant. But this was one of the prayers that was in our worship materials that I thought we'd end with. So um, this is a, a prayer that's adopted, adapted from Dr. King. When our eyes do not see the gravity of racial justice, shake us from our slumber and open our eyes, O Lord. When out of fear we are frozen into inaction, give us the spirit of bravery, O Lord. When we try our best, but we say the wrong things, Give us a spirit of humility, O oh Lord. When the chaos of this dies down, give us a lasting spirit of solidarity, O oh Lord. When it becomes easier to point fingers outwards, help us examine our own hearts, O oh Lord. God of truth, in your wisdom, enlighten us. God of hope, in your kindness, heal us. Creator of all people, in your generosity, guide us. Racism breaks your heart. Open our hearts for what breaks yours, O Lord, and allow us to find our community among all your children. Amen. Thank you. Um, next week will be Pastor Caesar um, from the Seventh Day of Venice. He'll be bringing some friends. Um, you'll learn about 
the Seventh Day Adventist tradition and um, get a lot of chances to ask them questions if you'd like. So come on out next Wednesday. It'll be fun. We will probably not. Hopefully not. Okay. Have a great night. Thank you.